So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, an anatomically bizarre and notorious fossil, but it's not from uh, the Burgess Shale or the Cambrian, but significantly more up column from the Carboniferous. So Tully Monstrum gregarium is a really well-known fossil. It's got a bit of a cult status amongst paleontologists and amateur collectors, especially over in America. Um, it's the state fossil of Illinois, and it's also been used by big companies like U-Haul as part of advertising campaigns, so it's really widely known by the public in the States. And in 1957, an amateur collector was looking over the spoil heaps of a coal mine just south of Chicago in Illinois, looking for uh, siderite concretions that contain the fossils of the Maison Creek Lagerstatt in the 310 million year old Francis Creek Shale member. And his name was Francis Tully, and he discovered, amongst others, uh, uh, hundreds of specimens of this bizarre creature that he had no idea what it was. So he took it to Eugene Richardson, who was the invertebrate curator at the Field Museum uh, in Chicago, who in a 1966 Nature paper gave it the designation of Tully's Common Monster, or Tully Monster in Bulgaria. But the problem that Eugene Richardson had was that he couldn't phylogenetically place Tully Monstrum. And in the six or so decades since Tully Monstrum's discovery, there have been a plethora of studies that have tried to put it basically in nearly every animal group, predominantly in the invertebrates, but there is one controversial study which suggested it was a conodont. And there is absolutely no consensus amongst any of these studies. And that's really interesting because there is some consensus about the body parts of Tully Monstrum. So Tully Monstrum consists of this long torpedo-shaped body with a, a large uh, post-anal uh, tail. It has this bizarre uh, transverse bar which runs perpendicular to the main body, which terminates in these bar organs. There's actually two, but this fossil only preserves one. It has this elephant trunk-like proboscis, which terminates in a claw or jaw, which is absolutely filled with teeth. And so what I wanted to do as part of my PhD project was trying to work out what Tully Monstrum was by looking for new characters, but I was also really interested in looking at some of the old characters in some more detail. And the character I was most interested in were these bar organs. And in the six studies I showed you earlier, they've been hypothesized to be everything from hydrodynamic stabilizers to paired copulatory organs. And there's really no consensus. And what's really interesting about these structures is they often preserve as these dark carbonaceous stains. And I'd seen these stains before on other work that I was doing in the Maison Creek. So my supervisor, Professor Gabbert, the Lester, she was looking at primitive vertebrates in the Maison Creek, such as hagfish at the top here and lampreys. And what she found is that where their eyes preserve, they often preserve as these dark carbonaceous stains. And they're absolutely packed with these tiny structures, which you can see on the SEM which she identified as melanosomes. So most of you have probably heard of melanosomes, but for those of you that haven't, they're the intracellular organelle which synthesizes and stores the pigment melanin. And they're found in pretty much uh, in all animals, but in humans, they're found in any tissue that's pigmented. But they're most densely packed and they're most notably found in places like the retina in the eye. And in paleontology, in 2008, Jakob Winkler made a discovery where he was looking at um, a 108 million year old fossil feather, and he wanted to know whether these black, fossil, uh, these black bands were an artifact of the fossilization process, or whether they were actually uh, uh, fossilized color. And in order to do that, he looked underneath the scanning electron microscope, looked with a scanning electron microscope, and what he found is that these black layers are absolutely packed with these melanin-bearing melanosomes, and that the white areas are completely devoid of these structures. So he inferred that this was indeed a uh, fossil color that was being preserved. And since 2008, there's been a whole suite of studies looking at everything from uh, primitive birds and, and looking at their plumage patterns using melanosomes to uh, uh, looking at the color of dinosaurs, such as Sinusoropteryx, which if you saw the headline in the Daily Mail was the first ginger dinosaur. They've been used to infer ecological changes in penguins, extinct penguin groups, and they've even been used to infer thermoregulation in uh, extinct marine reptiles. And I was looking at uh, Maison Creek vertebrates, such as the Sarcopterygians, the Axonopterygians, and Chondrichthians, and they too all preserve this dark carbonaceous stain where the eyes are. Some of them even preserve uh, lenses in keratomites. And all of their eyes are absolutely packed with these pigments, melanosomes. And so, obviously, the natural progression was for me to stick Tully Monster under the scanning electron microscope, and I'm sure you'll be surprised, but we found that they were absolutely packed with these melanosomes. And melanosomes are devoid, they're not found at all in any other structures in Tully Monstrum's body fossil or inside the matrix. But there's a little bit of a problem because there are, some scientists have shown that melanosomes can change their morphologies under diagenetic processes. 
And uh, so therefore, you cannot identify melanosomes just by looking at their shapes. So in order to uh, sort of work out whether these actually are melanin-bearing melanosomes, we use a technique called time-of-flight secondary ion mass spectrometry, or TOF-SIMS. And uh, the reason why we do this is because there was a great piece of work in 2015 by Cleary et al. And they identified that uh, extant melanin has a unique chemical signature that can be identified. And this chemical signature can uh, be tracked through different pressure and temperature regimes. And also that fossil melanosomes have their own distinct chemical signature. And when we plot our Tully Monstrum data into their data set, what we found is it fits perfectly with known fossil melanosomes. So therefore, we can say conclusively that not only do they look like melanosomes, but they are definitely melanin-bearing melanosomes. And that was really exciting for us because we had discovered the oldest pigment in the fossil record. And because it's restricted to this, uh, just this bar organ, and because it's so densely packed, we thought that the most parsimonious explanation that it's some form of eye pigmentation. So we can safely say uh, that, uh, that these are definitely eyes. And that actually has been postulated before in, in the first paper on uh, Tully Monstrum, which postulated that these could be indeed eyes. So what I wanted to know was, could we use these melanin-bearing melanosomes to phylogenetically place Tully Monstrum? And in order to do that, we looked at basically the screening pigments used in eyes across the whole animal kingdom. And what we found is that there are three main types of uh, screening pigment. Omicrones, terines, and melanins. And sadly for us, melanins are found in pretty much every animal group. So it's a, it's a really poor phylogenetic indicator. And that was obviously really disappointing. But then when we looked closer at the Tully Monstrum eyes, what we found was that there are two distinct melanosome morphologies, which if you know Jakob Winther, he describes as meatball melanosomes and sausage melanosomes. And this was a really vital clue for us because only vertebrates can synthesize two melanosome morphologies. Invertebrates only synthesize the meatball-shaped melanosomes. So therefore, we can say that Tully Monstrum must be a vertebrate. And we can go a little bit further than this, but this is work that we're doing at the moment. And if you use other characters, such as the tail, and also we have good evidence that it had biomineralized teeth, it's probably some form of nathostome. So Tully Monstrum is probably a bizarre and weird type of fish. And most people, when I tell them that it's probably a bizarre fish, say, well, I've never seen a fish that looks like Tully Monstrum. But there are extant examples, uh, such as Elecanthus fasciola, the dragonfish, that's larval forms have these bizarre eyes on stalks. And it superficially looks very similar to Tully Monster. So although highly derived and not directly related to Tully Monstrum, we can say that this evolutionary adaptation is not unique. And there are some really exciting implications that we, that we can infer on Tully Monstrum by looking at this ocular pigment. So when we were looking at these meatball melanosomes and these sausage melanosomes, what we found is that they're often quite clearly zoned. And when we looked at them in more detail and looked at a lot of samples, what we found is that they repeatedly show this layering structure. And that was really exciting for us. Because in the vertebrate eye, there are only three structures or three tissues that contain melanosomes, the iris, the choroid, and the retinal pigmented epithelium, or RPE. And only the RPE has two melanosome morphologies and has this uh, structural layering effect. So this is an extant anchovy eye that's been cross-sectioned, and you can see the sausage-shaped melanosomes at the top on the one there, and then the spherical melanosomes are on the bottom. So we can say that Tully Monstrum probably had an RPE. And the RPE is, does some really important jobs in the vertebrate eye. So it protects your receptor cells from pathogens because melanin is antibacterial. It also protects your receptor cells from UV light and acts to give nutrients as well. But the most vital job that the RPE does in the vertebrate eye is it absorbs stray light. So light bounces off an object and it enters uh, the eye, if it's a healthy eye, I should say. And then the receptor cells pick up that light, send a signal to the brain, which then interprets it as an image. If I remove the RPE, which would be a pretty messy operation, but if you remove the RPE, the light is then scattered, and basically the receptor cells pick up too much light and the image is whited out. So not only can we infer that Tully Monstrum had eyes that are packed with these pigments and that it probably had an RPE, but we can infer that it probably had really good visual acuity because this adaptation of having an RPE allows you to form clear visual images, which when your eyes are on stalks is really useful for looking for predators or prey, and also because the, the Maison Creek is hypothesized to be this estuarine environment, so if you're living in murky, murky waters, then it's a really useful adaptation to have. So in conclusion, we've identified and chemically confirmed the oldest pigment in the fossil record, although it is tied with Sarah Gabbett's work on the primitive um, 
vertebrates, then she'd probably kill me if I just sort of claimed all the glory in my own. Um, and as my supervisor, I don't want that. Um, as we've shown that the bar organs are definitely eyes. We've observed these two distinct melanosome morphologies, which shows that Tully Monstrum is definitely a vertebrate because it's a, a only a vertebrate character. We've distinguished these layerings, which is indicative of an RPE. And from an RPE, we can infer that it had good visual acuity. And for the first time ever, we've used melanosomes to phylogenetically place an enigmatic organism into the tree of life. So thank you very much for listening. And I'd like to reintroduce you to the weirdest carboniferous fish. Uh, the carboniferous fish? Uh, yeah, the weirdest carboniferous fish that's totally monster to be Thanks very much.